So in the video today, what we're going to take a look at is resistance, and then we'll have a look at the effect of temperature on resistance, and then finally, we'll have a look at some components which you can change the resistance of for semiconductors. So to start off with, to get an idea of actually what's going on inside a conductor, for instance. So most people have in this idea in their head, this idea that essentially like your charges are like nice smoothly moving around your circuit in a nice little chain, sort of like a sort of convoy going through your circuit. And actually the reality is far from that. So if we look at the path of say one electron through your circuit, we can see the path is extremely haphazard. We can see it's going all over the place. We can also see that in some occasions it's actually ending up going backwards around the circuit. Uh, as a result of its collisions with the lattice structure of the metal. So you can see here, we've got it pinging around all sorts of directions, but on average, what happens is it's going to move across this way because the potential difference we've applied is essentially making it go around this way. So we've got a general trend of movement this way, but don't think that doesn't mean you can't be going the other way, up and down, backwards, that's all going on. Okay. So that's actually what's happening. And as the electron collides with these, what happens is it transfers some of its electrical energy into thermal energy. So that's why resistors get hot when you use them, because that's what resistance is. It's from these collisions transferring electrical energy to thermal energy. Okay, so that's actually what's going on. Um, so let's look a bit more about the things that can affect resistance. So essentially, Good conductors, as you should know, are things with free electrons, which are what makes metal such good conductors, their structure has a lot of free electrons in it. And generally speaking, the more free electrons your structure has, the more charge you can pass per second, therefore the higher current you can have. And if you can pass a higher current, you have a lower resistance. So that's what's going on in this one. If you have a wire with a larger cross-sectional area, what that means is more charges can flow through it per second. So think about it like if you took a pipe and made it have a much larger cross-section area, you could pass a lot more water through it per second. It's the same with wires as well. If you have a larger cross-section area, what that's going to mean is you can send more charge per second and therefore lower the resistance. If you make your wire longer, what you do is essentially add in more um, atoms or like molecules or whatever it is from the structure that can get in the way. So if you make it longer, you create more of those collisions. So you're going to transfer more energy into thermal energy. So that means you've got a higher resistance essentially there. And then last one, if you increase the temperature of a conductor, what happens is those, um, those atoms which it's colliding, so like these ones over here, Essentially, these are going to be vibrating around a lot more, and they're going to get much more in the way of your charges trying to pass through. And what's going to happen as a result of that is, essentially, you're going to transfer more energy into thermal energy, so you're going to see a higher resistance, or you're going to slow the path of the electrons through, so you lower your flow of charge through your conductor. So those are the things you can use to affect resistance. And this is nicely summarized in an equation, which is often called the resistivity equation. So what you've got, your, your terms, resistance, your length of your conductor, the cross-sectional area, and a property called resistivity, which is used to look at the other factors apart from length and area that will affect resistance. So this resistivity term, this one here, is essentially, it's a property of materials, which means for, if I pick, say, for instance, steel, all steel if it's at the same temperature, it has the same resistivity, which is quite useful to us, so we can just look it up. However, if we change the temperature, like heat it up, what we do is we actually change the resistivity of the material. So that's why there was this proviso of assuming temperature stays the same. So we can change resistivity, but at the same temperature, all steels or all aluminiums or all coppers, whatever, have the same resistivity, which is quite useful to us. And if you um, rearrange this equation, so we take the area and the length the other side, what you can do is work out your resistivity has the unit of ohm meters. So ohms multiplied by meters there is the unit of it. And it's essentially it's a measure of how good a conductor a material is. Okay, so let's have a look at putting this to use. Um, so we've chosen a wire, we've looked it up in our directory, and we've got 
its resistivity is 2 ohm meters. And we want to know what its resistance will be if you have it of a certain size, so diameter 1 millimeter and length 20 centimeters. So the first thing we're going to do is work out our cross-sectional area. And with wires, what we do is we assume they're cylinder in shape, so their cross-sectional area is a circle. Um, so we've been given the diameter, so this is the area of a circuit equation that we want. We're making sure to convert into SI units or meters there. We calculate essentially what the cross-sectional area is. And then we can plug that into this equation over here, remembering to convert your length into meters, and you come up with this value here, 5.1 times 10 to the 5. Now the thing to go here is, hang on, didn't he just say that was a wire? Isn't that resistance massive? Yes, whatever this is would be a terrible, terrible wire to use because its resistance is colossal. Um, so yes, reflecting on your answer and thinking that's a ridiculous resistance for a wire. True, but it's been done correctly in this case, but always a good check. Okay, so that concludes the linking temperature and resistance and looking at resistivity section. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go on to look at semiconductors. So since I'm changing topic, what I need is an outfit change. Okay, so earlier what we looked at was that generally speaking, increasing the temperature increases the resistance of a component. Um, so what that means is most components are PTC or positive temperature coefficient. So what that means is just fancy language for if you increase the temperature, resistance increases, but this is the proper way to describe that. However, not all things have that relationship. So um, there are some devices which we can actually change the properties of. So what we can do is we can change the number of free electrons in the structure of that component, which is very useful because it allows us to control certain scenarios. So some examples of these, uh, you may have heard of some of these before. So light dependent resistors or LDRs, uh, thermistors or sorry, specifically NTC thermistors. So we'll take a look at a few of those different components. Okay, so the thermistor. So this is a contradiction to the rule I just told you about. So although most devices increase temperature, increase resistance, an NTC thermistor or a negative temperature coefficient resistor decreases its resistance as you increase the temperature. So increasing the temperature increases the number of free electrons in the structure of it so it can actually carry more charge per second so it has a lower resistance. And if you're looking at a circuit diagram, if you want to know what a thermistor or identify a thermistor, it looks like one of these here. So that's an NTC thermistor. Um, we've got the other device I told you about earlier, so an LDR or a light dependent resistor. So this changes the number of free electrons dependent with light intensity. So if you increase the light intensity acting on it, so you send in more photons per second to the device, that frees up more electrons as well and then lowers the resistance or increases the rate of flow of charge around your circuit. Um, so that's what's going on. And if you want to identify one, you will see a circuit symbol that looks like this in your circuit. Um, so these are useful for automatic lights, for instance, because if the light intensity drops, you can make that turn on something in your circuit. But we'll get onto that a bit later in the course. Okay. And then a special type uh, you may have heard of, it's a very funky name, superconductor, sounds awesome straight away. Um, so a superconductor is a bit interesting because if you reach a certain temperature called the transition temperature, what happens is the resistivity of the material suddenly becomes zero. So in my mind, the way I imagine this is before we had this electron passing haphazardly all around, going backwards, forwards, that kind of thing. In a superconductor, that's not happening. So these uh, particles are almost fixed in place. They're slightly vibrating, but they're basically fixed in place. And your electron can essentially pass through unopposed by any of the, st the structural atoms inside your wire. Um, so if it's not colliding with any of these, it's not transferring any energy to thermal energy, so it's not having any energy loss. And if it's not transferring anything to thermal energy, that means resistance now is zero. Um, so that's what's going on with a superconductor. I would highly encourage you to go away and look a bit more into them. Uh, they're a fascinating topic of current research as well. Uh, so in terms of the transition temperature, if you look at a graph of temperature versus resistance for a superconductor, what it looks like is this, so quite similar to an ohmic conductor, but this section, but you reach a temperature and suddenly 
bam, there is suddenly no resistance because the resistivity has become zero at that point. Um, so these are potentially being going to be put to use in the future. So we can use these in our electromagnets, for instance, because they allow us to have a very high current. We also are looking at using these to back up power plants, seeing as you could just store energy indefinitely using superconductors because it's never losing energy as well. And potentially you could use these in uh, power cables connecting power stations. So power cables you want to run really high currents through because it doesn't matter what the current is if you're not losing any energy as well. Um, so that's your superconductor and that's where I'm going to leave off this video for today. Um, so this video followed on from my video on the circuitry laws. So if you haven't looked at that, do check that out. Um, coming up next uh, with in this sort of this series, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a potential divider, which is a sneaky way of dealing with circuits to simplify them as well. So do check that out as well. And thank you very much for watching.